And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Room 42. I'm Liz Fraley from Single Sourcing Solutions. I'm your moderator. This is Janice Summers, our interviewer, and welcome to Giuseppe Ghetto, today's guest in Room 42. Now, Giuseppe is an Associate Professor of Technical and Professional Communication at East Carolina University. He is president and founder of Content Garden, a digital marketing content strategy and UX firm. His research focuses on using user experience design, content strategy, and other participatory research methods to help people improve communities and organizations. He's been published everywhere. We've seen him talk as keynote speaker. He was at TC Camp when we did it back East. And he is extremely well known for being in technical communication, IEEE transactions and professional communication, computers and composition and intercom and boxes and arrows. And he's the co-editor of Content Strategy and Technical Communication, a book you can get on Amazon. Today, he's here to help us start answering the question, how technical communicators can create user-focused, content-driven content that improves customer experience. Welcome, Giuseppe. Thanks. Appreciate it. Hello, Giuseppe. It's so nice to have you here. Yes, great to be here. So something you said, and I've been sitting with this for a while, and for me, it was quite inspiring. And it was it was an interesting um, picture of the customer, the consumer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and what you were saying was, I kind of took this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if we look at the consumer journey, that there's three roads, right? You've got the seekers, and those are the people who are looking for information or researching, reading, watching videos, that type of thing. Then you've got the people who are kind of on an automatic path. It's just like they're following a trend or they're just, they're coming to you because they're just walking down this path. Not really, I don't want to say not thinking, yeah. but it's, um, they're just, it's an automatic response, That's right. right? And then you've got the loyalists, right? You've got that road of the loyalists who have a strong relationship, who, who've uh, built a relationship of trust with you. So they keep coming back because of that strength and relationship. Yeah. Now, TechCom is strategically located at the crossroads of all these three roads right. that come in. Did I get that right? Yeah, I mean, and I think that you can think of those as personas, meaning that we're all those mm-hmm. people for different products and services, right? So mm-hmm. I think the given and and what drives a lot of us in content strategy right now is that loyalty is, is not a, is not a given right now. Right. You know, you've got consumers out there who have access to more products and services than ever before in human history. Right. Mm -hmm. Look at, look at the internet. You can find, I just, I just ordered some, you know, interesting image. I'm, I'm like into the martial arts. Right. So I was looking for, you know, a particular image of, iconic image of Bruce Lee and, and his instructor at man couldn't find it anywhere, but in Greece, there was a guy in Greece who had wow. made this picture. And so I was able to, through a simple Google search, right? So mm-hmm. you're not beholden to local business. You're not beholden to people right across the street from you. So that mm-hmm. means that your content needs to be smarter because of that. Right. And you need to not only court new customers, new consumers, but you need to keep people loyal to you through continued effort. Right. And the customer journey is really interesting because all the data, you know, I'm in education. So a lot of people in the business school I teach in here, uh, I teach their students a lot rather. They're still teaching this marketing funnel where it's like, oh, you, you market enough and then you get your word out there and people find out about your product or service and they buy it and then they're instantly loyal. That's just not the case anymore. Um, and particularly the post-purchase experience is something that in tech com is, is really key because right. think about the products and services we're using today too. They're increasingly complex. Right. Right. Yeah. right. What if you buy something like an API from a vendor, you know, an application programming inter- interface, yeah. a, a piece of software, a piece of code. Yeah. You need lots of information to, to make that, that product run. And so <clears throat> that post-purchase experience is really where technical communicators can shine because we have all that information and we can make it understandable to people too. 
And that's what um, also helps, you know, the technical communicator build loyalty. Because I'm just thinking about that as you're talking about that and, and a software that uh, package that I had bought to plug into my website mm-hmm. and post post purchase, I had problems and their, their communication was terrible. So, yeah. you know, I shredded yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And that's what happens. I mean, we've all had this, we've all had this experience, right? Where as a consumer, we're just trying to get something work to work. It's usually a piece of technology and mm-hmm. it doesn't work. And we go to the manufacturer of the technology and they pass this on to the customer service rep and nobody is paying attention to our, you know, customer experience. Nobody's right. in charge right. of all that. Right. And that's an organization that doesn't have a content strategist. Um, because that's really what, you know, I'm, I'm channeling, you know, um, Rockley and Cooper and, and their book, Managing Enterprise Content, where they say, who's looking out for the customer experience? You know, who's in the organization looking at the marketing content and the technical content and <clears throat> the stuff that's going to this, you know, internal stakeholder, all that. Who's looking at all of that mm-hmm. and mining it and making sure it's going to the right people for the right reasons. And often it's nobody. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. It's, it's different people in different departments working across purposes. And we see that as a consumer because, you know, it doesn't make sense to us. Right. Isn't that like the also because you said something about uh, consumer focus, I think, uh, user focus, creating your content to be user focused rather than because. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a lot of times people get caught in this trap of, let me tell you a feature, let me tell you a feature, let me tell you this, let me tell you this, rather than taking it from the perspective of who's using this, what do they need to know? What do they right. want to know? Right, and marketers, you know, which, which I you know, work with and am myself sometimes, get a bad rap for this, right? Because we're always saying, hey, look at this cool stuff that <clears throat> this product or service can do. But... <clears throat> You know, really the whole, the thing that marketers are talking about now, which is really exciting is personalization. Mm -hmm. So they get this, they get that content needs to be user focused. Like every user of a product or service is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So they want to say, here's how this can work for you. And oh, if this doesn't work for you, maybe we can make a version of it that, that does work. You know, one of my one of my favorite products slash services <clears throat> that's a perfect example of this is Evernote. Okay, so Evernote is something that a lot of academics use. It's just a simple note taking app, but they have a great user focused content strategy. When you first mm-hmm. purchase Evernote, the first thing that happens is they send you a series of emails. They warn you. They say we're going to send you four emails, but these emails are going to help you onboard to the app, and they're going to start with the basic experiences. And then they're going to go more advanced. You can not read them, but you might want to save them for later. You know, they're very. I like that. Yeah, they're very hands on, but also kind of hands off. Right. But if you read those emails and you and you look at their blog and all their all their documentation, there's tons of information of, hey, are you a baker? Are you trying to keep recipes on Evernote? Are you a research scientist? Like they have all these different ideas and they have a huge community, too, Mm -hmm. of, you know, stuff driven by users where people say, Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm trying to build this whole other thing from Evernote. How can I do that? You know, and they have moderators that go in. So they're, they're really focused on their content strategy. And that's why they have my Mm -hmm. loyalty because their whole business model is every year I have to let them take, it's like 60 bucks a year for Evernote premium. Mm -hmm. That's all, that's all they have to get from me. You know, Mm -hmm. they work hard for that. For that. Yeah. They, 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 they earn it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they work harder than some of the things, you know, I've bought stuff way more expensive than that. And yeah, no, one has, work for yeah. Yeah. no one has ever helped me or even reached out to me about that purchase. Yeah. So. It, I, I like that, um, that it, it's still, there's still marketing, right? Can marketing is important. Yeah. We can't get away from marketing the professional writer. It's not all just tech writing. If there's professional writing. Right. Um, but I like the fact that um, they're, they're looking at things a little different from the user perspective, because you still need to explain features to people. But right. if you if you take into consideration, like you said, personas, then you can make sure you're explaining the features appropriately to the right audience. Like yeah. I could self-select, right? 
like Liz is a computer whiz. And if, you know, she's trying to develop something, she can go look at a developer version. I would have to look at the end user version. You know what I mean? Right. Like That's if you're right. just using this application, you only need this much, right? Yeah. And that's I think a hard more... transition to make though. I, I, I want to get back to you, but I want to, um, it was hard. Janice and I are partners and she, she takes, I would be very, you know, I'm very technical. I'm like, well, you can't quite say it that way because that's not quite perfectly right. Accurate this way, right. <laughs> it has to say this. And she like, she would then rephrase it in a more accessible way. Right. And then it took a while for me to realize that that's okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, it makes me think of my favorite dynamic or my, my favorite developer, I should say, and the dynamic between us, which his name is Thomas. I won't use his last name because he probably doesn't want me to broadcast his whole name, but <laughs> he works with me through Content Garden and we're, we're actually working on a new venture right now. But we go through this all the time, right? Where he'll say, well, just tell the, the customer, blah, 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 blah. And I say, Thomas. I did not understand what you just said. <laughs> so I guarantee the customer is not going to understand, right. it, you know? Right. So we have this back and forth because he, you know, he's like a mathematician. That's what I think of him. Mm-hmm. He's in this realm of like theoretical physics and mm-hmm. I'm here on the earth plane trying to say, look, this is the actual need that the customer has. So what can I say to them, you know, that is going to make sense and it's going right. to connect with what you need to do as a developer. So that's, that's right. a perfect, and you get that a lot in UX, right? This is a you common do. user experience problem is why, why doesn't the user just realize that if they did these 15 things, they could make I'll the thing clear. work. Right. You know, and they don't understand the vocabulary we're using in the way that we use it. Right. You know, and it's the same with the, like academia, you know, academia yeah. is the same way. Like, why can't this person understand my epistemology of my blah, 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 you know? Well, they don't have a PhD. <laughs> right, right. You know, you need to, you need to reach out to them and make this, make this make, you know, make more sense. And that's why I'm so excited about, you know, ventures like Room 42, because we do need to have more of a touchstone between <clears throat> academic eggheads like myself and, you know, other folks that are that are out there trying to solve problems you know we have great ideas that people can use but we don't always explain those in in you know plain enough speech that people can actually use them absolutely i see it occasionally sometimes in like in a different way in the tech com marketing dynamic as well right this is the way we do it this is the way that the that i pm told me to say it this is the way engineering told me to say it and Marty's like, what the, ha- what, what are you saying here? Yeah. Right. And half the time the user comes to the health topic and is like, what is this? Yeah. Right. We all fall into that in our technical way, in our own little technical world, we all fall into that. Yeah. You and know? again, there's different types of users. So I, I've never done a user research study and found only one type of user. It's never right. happened. Right. I've never right. done a user study and come up with one persona. Cause we're all like snowflakes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, it's always a spectrum, right? There are people who are like, stop talking down to me. I am a developer. Mm-hmm. I don't need the basic introduction, right? I don't need the stereo instruction. I need the advanced features. Just give me those. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's those impatient users and you have to, you know, you have to be, you know, I mean, I didn't read the first several emails from Evernote because <laughs> they were getting started, which I had already done and basic features. <clears throat> right. But I read the second two, which were about more advanced features and especially how to annotate and keep and basically build a bibliography, which is what as an academic oh, I use. Every yeah. Right. You know, so you have to cater to those different. And again, somebody has to look at all that. So that tells me somebody, they may not call themselves a content strategist, but somebody to ever know is thinking about that stuff. Right. You and know, they're looking, <clears throat> they're looking where, the actual data. Where do you get, where, what do you look at? <clears throat> That's like, a very good question. And it really depends. So <clears throat> some of the different applications I've, well, I'll just talk about like one I'm working on right now. So I'm, I'm helping to develop this mobile boating app um, with a partner here at East Carolina University and it's a safety app, right? So the big problem uh, on the water right now is that recreational boaters, well, not now because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but <laughs> in a pre-pandemic world, <clears throat> when people are out in, in the sunshine pandemic, boating, when we're back out there, 
That's right. Post pandemic, right? knock wood. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of accidents. Like the the waterways, I didn't know this before getting involved with this application are, are way less regulated than roadways, right? There's way less safety measures. So this app basically would be <clears throat> a, a, an active way to see basically or integrate with existing technology and basically warn people of, Hey, you've got a vessel that's however many, you know, feet or, you know, you know, oh, yard how far away it is. Yeah. It's, it's heading this way. <clears throat> it's this type of vessel. Is it a kayak? Right. And you're a big yeah. vessel or is it a mit, you know, what is it? And it's mm -hmm. coming your way and you need to be aware of this. And we'd also gather data for people that regulate waterways to say what is happening out there. Cause we don't have really that data right now. Mm -hmm. And so when I did this um, study, I basically interviewed recreational boaters and that's where you start. You go and find people who somehow connect with the thing you're trying to create and the content you're trying to create. And you say, and you don't ask them about the app. That's, that's the last thing. The first thing you say is, who are you? You know, mm -hmm. so you say, tell me about what you do when you go out on a boat. And I got all these different stories from <clears throat> I canoe on a lake that is five miles from where I live to, you know, I was a merchant captain for 15 years. And now I have a, <clears throat> you know, 42 foot, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and then you take all those stories and then you try to look for patterns and say, okay, what are the connecting points here that we can build this user experience? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, did the, what do we have in common? <clears throat> and then at the end of the conversation too, <clears throat> you don't have to do this, depends on where you are, but you know, we kind of knew what we wanted to do. So we said, well, what if you had an app that could do these several things, which of these would be most valuable? And they all said, well, th you know, this, this thing would be really valuable. Well, that's good because that's what we're trying to get it to do. There's a way basically to notify people you're on the water and file this official report so the Coast Guard can find you. Yeah. Um, it's called a float plan, kind of like a flight plan, right? Mm -hmm. But then from that, you know, well, what about these other things? And, and, oh, well, you know, could it do this? And could it do that? So you get ideas based on their actual experiences. I mean, you know, sometimes when I talk to people, I'm like, don't forget the experience word of user experience like this is about what people are already doing and it's supposed to help them mm -hmm. right right you know it's not just supposed to suck them into the world of the app it's actually supposed to be part of their world and what they're already doing right because you want the app to integrate into their life not them integrate their life into your app right <clears throat> well and that's the difference between being user focused yeah. versus yeah. product focused that's right right, that's right. yeah yeah that's pretty much it in, in like a small story. Yeah. That <laughs> too often we feel it's the other way as users. That's right. I, I've got to con court my way <laughs> into what, the way you view the world. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. And to borrow a term from academia, you know, <clears throat> it's really about rhetoric at the end of the day. It's about persuasion because you're trying to persuade consumers that, hey, this product or service is useful to you. The best way to do that, of course, is to actually make it useful. Make you know, it useful. Genuine. <laughs> kind of you sells know. itself that way. Yeah, people forget <laughs> that sometimes, though, right? They try to trick people. They try right. to say, well, this is really useful to you. Ha, ha, ha. But then you get it and you start using it and you're like, ah, I shouldn't have bought this. This actually isn't useful to me. So that's why I got so excited about UX when, <clears throat> you know, I started to really get into it, you know, about you know, five or six years ago, whenever I started getting really into it, you know, because it's, it's so authentic, right? It's about mm -hmm. actually taking what people need and putting that at the center of the process, as opposed to just sort of, you know, what we think of, again, as bad marketing, where you're just trying to trick people into thinking, no, this is something you really need right now. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to get people to participate and, and do interviews and, and give you feedback as, and give you that user experience research? So it tends not to, but to be fair, I have, you know, I think it's harder on the more like broad-based consumer apps, which I don't tend to work on personally. Like I tend to work on far more technical apps 
where you right. have a lot more excited users, honestly. <laughs> you know, like recreational boaters are a small community, yeah, but I mean, they love recreational boating and they will talk to anybody about yeah. recreational boating. And they all have pain points, it turns out, about there are technologies to help them, but they are all not so great. Right. You know, so they all have pain points. So when you're dealing with a, uh, a user group like that, that's really committed to the experience, I think it's a lot easier from, I mean, I've talked to people in the more like consumer electronics and broad based mm -hmm. technology world. And it's a lot harder. It's harder to, to get folks because those folks are way less loyal to like a mobile app or something like that, that they download right. on the phone just randomly. Right. So it's a lot harder to get feedback. And then I think you need to use incentives. That's what a lot of them do. They'll actually pay people for participation or say, you know, here's an Amazon gift card, something. Right. That they feel like their time is respected because you know this is one small part of all the stuff they're 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 into well and i imagine when you have a broad-based application or broad-based product your sample of the population has to be significantly higher as well yeah right? so that adds even more challenge that's right you have to somehow control for okay am i getting like this little sliver right. of people who are the ones that really want the gift card, you know? Right, right, right. And so what they'll do, the bribe. <laughs> that's right. The smart folks will look at other data, <clears throat> you know? I mean, this is this is what I encourage. And, you know, it's from talking to other folks as many of my, <laughs> my ideas come from, but, you know, they'll say, okay, <clears throat> what's our total demographic data look like? Mm -hmm. You know, and who do we need to talk to within that pie chart? I mean, that's what, a persona is, I, I always tell my students, I'm like, a persona is just a slice of a pie chart mm -hmm. with a face, you know, but you need to make sure that you're actually dealing with a slice of the pie chart that's significant and you're not dealing with, you know, a tiny little, you know, slice of a pie chart that is not a at selected, all. You know. A selected nibble that you like. <laughs> yeah. Overly represented. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I will say these are the people, these are like high level folks like, mm -hmm. you know, um, Jim Kalbach is somebody I really respect in the UX world. And he's a he's a rock star and he, he's written several books now. And I was fortunate enough to do a workshop with him once when I talked to sort of the rank and file content strategy folks, some of whom I've, tra I've trained, you know, and the rank and file UX folks. This is a struggle. <clears throat> this is not easy. You know, so I hear stories of like, well, how do you do your user testing? I always ask whenever I encounter a content strategist or UX designer or a technical communicator in the wild, I always ask them all these questions about what they do. And it always comes down to, well, we didn't really have time to talk to any users. Or I went to the neighborhood Starbucks and I sat my laptop down in front of some people and, and got, and I'm like, wow. And you work at blah, blah, blah company. So they struggle with this. <clears throat> They struggle to to find to find the time. First of all, that's the big thing they report to me. Right. Um, you know, in academia, you know, I I have a lot of flexibility. Yeah, you know, that they don't. Yeah. Have, so. Yeah, that you don't have, and yeah, that's true. In the commercial world, there's not a lot of flexibility, and you know, I mean, when you talk about user experience and you want to pull people, you have to bribe them. Yeah. That takes budget. So now you got time and budget that you don't have. That's right. So what yeah. do you do? Well, and, you know, I actually wrote an article about this very topic. But oh. Because <laughs> a, big, a big struggle. Oh, yeah. Too, yeah. <laughs> a big struggle. A big struggle is, you know, <clears throat> this the struggle of time. And also I have people talking to me like, well, there's like 50 UX methods out there. There's like 50 ways to you know, you know, talk to users, what do I do, you know? So <clears throat> I tried to come up with, I mean, the two classic methods are contextual inquiry and usability testing, right? So you interview users about their experiences and then you do usability testing with a prototype, right? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> and I'm not the first one to talk about this, but I think in academia I am, at least I didn't find anybody else that was saying the same thing, but I thought, well, what if we could combine those? And, and I also deal with time crunches in academia not mm -hmm. all the time, right? But there's some times where it's like, hey, we're submitting for this grant, right? <clears throat> we all have teaching duties. Like, you know, I don't have infinite time either. Right. So I thought, wouldn't it be more efficient to sit down and do 
as many things as I could when I have a user, really pick their brain. So, you know, I came up with this thing I call the story test story method. The story it's test story? Story test story, yeah. Okay. And it's, I mean, if you go to my website, it's like a couple a couple blog posts ago. Maybe I think it's the second blog post from the homepage. So if you go to giuseppegato.com and you click back at the bottom of the page, you'll find it, you know, reference the article. But basically... Well, and you have a search query on there too. They can just type in story. Yeah, find yeah. It. you yeah. store a test story on the, on the search, yeah. you'll find it too. But the idea is, it's basically what I talked about. You go to uh, a user and you start with a story. So you start by asking them who they are. And there's mm -hmm. some of the strict usability testing folks will be like, no, that will bias them, blah, blah, blah. But you're not talking about the application. So I don't right. see how it's going to bias them. You're talking them about you, about them. Rather. About them, right. Right. So you get this story about really how they get to the app. Like what makes you yeah. a recreational voter? What makes you whatever you are, right? Then you say, okay, now we're going to do a usability test. And it's, you know, a little you know, like, oh, okay, you know. And <clears throat> obviously, you know, I mean, I... I've talked to people that are like, they'll do like a 90 minute interview with a user and then their usability test will take an hour. So you're not talking about, this is not that. <laughs> this is a lot leaner than that. You know, you're like 15, 20 minutes interviewing them and then you're doing like maybe a 25 to 30 minute usability test. Mm -hmm. Then though, <clears throat> once they have the, the application in their head, and this is very common, you know, they're, they often want to talk about it. This is a very common right. thing, right? So you let them talk, you say, well, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? And, and where do you think, and they always have ideas, right? Yeah. Some of them are not great, but you, you're, again, you're learning more about them. You're learning about what their preferences are. Well, and you never know. Okay. So you never know where an idea is going to come from either. This is the room 42 thing too. It's like, you know, we're going to have a conversation because you never know what's going to scream. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But one of the things you talk about is you talk about the fact that you're you're getting to know them as a person. That's right. <clears throat> right? Before they're ever even, okay, now we're gonna go test this app. Yeah. I don't know, to me personally, I think that's a very important step. Yeah. And you're yeah. talking to them about their life and their experience because anyone, right. so look at anyone who's going to come to a product or a service is a person. That's right. <laughs> and they've got this whole backstory. That's right. That influences how they're going to respond, no matter yeah. what. That's right. And if you're taking the time to get to know them, they feel heard. Yes. They feel appreciated. Yeah. So they'll actually, if they're testing it, they're going to spend, uh, I know I would, Giuseppe, if you were getting to know me, I would spend more time in your app and I would give you more candid feedback. Yeah. And that's what tends to happen in my experience. I mean, I've used both. I've used just sort right. of draw usability testing with no context. I, you know, I introduce what we're going to do. I'm going to you know, take you through some features. We're testing the app, not you, but blah, blah, blah. Right. You get better responses. You get more thinking, you know, because usually you're doing some sort of talk aloud protocol. Why did you do this? Yeah. They're way more engaged. Right. When you ask them, I mean, who, who is it? It's flattering to have someone ask about yourself. Well, yeah, it's just, it's, you're acknowledging that I'm a human being, right? Because, right. you know, people do think. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. When your guard comes down and you're not yeah. so, you know, protective when right. you can be open and somebody recognizes you. Yeah. 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 And a great book about this, by the way, is uh, Jim Portugal's Interviewing Users. That's where I got a lot of my ideas about how to interview a user correctly. He's really got a great kind of Zen mojo when it comes to interviewing people that I really love. Right. <clears throat> but it's everything we're talking about. It's validating them. It's, you know, he, you know, hearing their stories, being a good listener, not interrupting them, you know, letting them go down these kind of alleyways with their story. Right. And their story, that backstory, like you said, it doesn't have to be directly about that app. It's yeah. about them because then you've warmed me up. You've, you've established that little thing, that little important thing that yeah. every company goes for. And it's called relationship. That's right. That's right. And that's, that's important. Yeah. And that's the way to build a relationship, right? It's starting a conversation. Like if you're not willing to converse with somebody, you're not going to have much of a relationship with them. If your conversation is, hi, would you like to buy this? You know, if that's the first thing. <laughs> Want to buy a watch? <laughs> you say. I get these emails all the time. And it's like that guy on the street corner. It's like, what about a watch? You know, what if I <laughs> this cool app that I just emailed you about that you've never heard of? Like, no, right. I don't. 
Act we now. Are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who you are. How'd you get my email? So, and this applies because, so this is top of mind. I'm working on the STC's website task force. Um, right. And this is one of the discussions, like how do you redesign the website? What goes on the front page? Yeah. That's the, hi, do you want to talk to me more? <laughs> right? You don't fill it with everything on the face of the planet because you're not, you don't have a baby on the first date. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And a lot of people, this is a great topic for content strategy because a lot of people make that mistake, right? I tell people, you know, <clears throat> I, I love the, the metaphor of the, the, the website as a negative metaphor, as the website's brochure, because that's what most people think of it as. Yeah. It's everything in there. Here's all the stuff we do. Here's some photos of us. Here's us, 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 everything. I'm like, <clears throat> no, you want to think of it as like a social media post. Okay. Every page of your website should do one thing. Yeah. And that's, it. And that's exactly the home page is an introduction. Mm -hmm. That's all it should do. <clears throat> here's so you're looking, and it starts with them. So you're looking for blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Here's what you've been looking for. Yeah. You know, it's an introduction to a conversation. And right. most people miss that. They jam so much information onto that homepage and every page of their site that, you know, no one's going to read all that. And they get there and they're like, oh, this, is one, this isn't what I was looking for. And then it's abandoned. It. Yeah. <clears throat> when it may have been what they're looking for, but it's just not organized in a way that makes sense to them at that, at that moment. And that's, you know, that's a, <clears throat> I don't know who, I've actually tried to trace this phrase and I can't find who actually said this first, but somebody said content strategy is about delivering the right content to the right people at the right time for the right reasons. I've heard it said, but not with the content strategy as the beginning part. Right. Author unknown. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, unknown. Yeah. I've, tried, unknown. <laughs> I've heard a ton of people say it, yeah. but I, I've never like, tried who said that exactly as a content strategist first, but yeah, but it's a great, it's a great mantra because that's the whole thing, right? You're yeah. it's, it's about this timeliness, which in, again, the theoretical, academic jargon we call kairos you know the opportune moment like you got to catch people at that opportune moment and there's lots of data out there you know there's search engine data yeah. mm -hmm. you can see what people are searching for when they find your website so look at that and say oh they were looking for this over here when they found this what if we you know reshaped our content to match more what they were actually looking for you know or not match point, as it were yeah, this is an interesting point because there's also seasonal things. People respond right. differently in different seasons. That's right. And in different yeah. different conditions. Like right now, yeah. we're in a particular global condition yes. that won't be forever, right? right. And, and there will be a post um, this, but right now, I, I could see where you would want to change your content to help address the here and now, yeah. and then again change it again because websites are never dead. They're never finished. No. Anyone who thinks the website's done is crazy because you're never right. done. And you yeah, and people, people talk about evergreen content, which I talk about, and it's great. But yeah. there is truly evergreen content because what you want is long lasting content, right? You mm -hmm. don't want something that's going to be out of date tomorrow right. if you can avoid it, but it's all eventually going to go out of date. I mean, right. go back to your content you wrote, you wrote five years ago. Is it still relevant? Right. right. Well, and right. right. And think about too, the, the, the content consumer has evolved and changed. They've right. grown up there. There's new generations coming. So there right. you can make assumptions now That's right. that you couldn't have made five to 10 years ago. Yep. So when you create your content for the user, you, you, you create it different. You, That's right. You know what I mean? It's you're, it's, you're speaking to a group that is more computer savvy. Yeah. Like the internet is not brand new. That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you look at all the, you look at all the industries that are supposedly being laid waste by the millennials and, um, and what are we on generation? Z? Zoomers. Yeah. 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 And, and the, 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 the it's funny because there's all these articles about, you know, the millennials, which is just the group for anybody under 40 now. <laughs> <laughs> The millennials are old. Twelve year old, yeah, twelve year olds clear to you know, like some millennials are like, "Hey, I have a mortgage, dude. I'm not, a, I'm not a twelve year old." Like, <laughs> but you know, it's like, oh, this these people are killing off that. And what I hear is, we didn't know how to adapt, yeah, to these folks, yeah, 
Yeah. We didn't know how to change. And now we're mad because they don't want what we're, what we're selling. Well, of course not. They, they're coming up in a different world. Like you yeah. need to adapt to what they, to what they want, you know? Well, and sometimes too, I think it's hard, you know, when we've been doing something for so many years and so yeah. long that, you know, and this is true in, in corporate in technical writing. It's like, well, we've always yeah. done it that way. That's right. And it's not, it's not that we're intentionally trying to block change or progress, but it's, right. it's just one of those human natures that we get caught in that we've always done it that way. And then we have to catch ourselves and say, okay, yeah, that means I should probably reevaluate this. If I'm saying we've always done it that way. Yeah. yeah. Good time to reevaluate and look at, yeah. and look at, am I being user focused and am I being user focused to the users of the here and now? Right. Right. When was the last time I checked that? When was right. the last time I talked to an actual user? Right. right, right, right. And even if you're not, so what do you do if you're in a situation where you can't really have contact with your user? I mean, there's got to be people out there who don't have contact. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I like to say we make lots of decisions, even if we're working on a project and it's only taking three weeks to develop something. You know, we're, yeah. we're doing these really, you know, intense sprints. You can't, you're not going to have a user sitting beside you the whole time saying, no, 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 don't do that. Put that over there. Right. right. <laughs> so <clears throat> what you need to do is that's where I think personas come in. You know, you gather mm -hmm. as much, <clears throat> you know, uh, user information as you can, mm -hmm. and you use that to craft a persona. So a persona um, and here I'm, I'm citing uh, Shlomo Goltz's article from Smashing Magazine on personas, which is great. Just Google Smashing Magazine personas, you'll probably find it. I think it's called Persona Non Grata is the name of the title. But he says, you know, this is a, this is a cast of characters that designers can use when they're designing. So then once you've got these personas, again, it's like that pie chart. What you have to do is keep in touch with those users so make sure that you're still gathering information and refreshing your personas but your personas and that's one thing i will say like i, I don't remember the last time i talked to anybody in in the corporate world that doesn't have personas they all have personas now which is great my only question is when was the last time they refreshed them yeah because every you know i deal with a lot of tech writers of course through the stc when i'm teaching there or talking there and i always ask you know how long have you been there oh five years and were these the personas when you started up? And of course they were. So who knows how long those personas have been around. Those personas are old. They may not oh, represent yeah. real people anymore. So that's the only problem, but you just got to refresh them. Yeah. Right. But unless you're going to do participatory design, which is the other end of the spectrum where you literally do sit down and design with users. And that's very hard to do in a lot of cultural contexts. Mm -hmm. You, you got to have some stopgap, and that's something like personas or other forms of data that you can get in real time because yeah, users are busy and they can't be bothered to, to design the thing with you a lot of times. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty pro persona. Are there people who are anti persona? There are. And it's interesting. I, I, I see, I review, this is a common thing in academia, right? <clears throat> you live long enough to see your own ideas critiqued, right? So I'm a big fan <laughs> of personas. And yeah. people know that about me. You know, I wrote an article s s several years back about personas with Kirk St. Amon and we get cited a lot. But there was another article <clears throat> that was written around the same time, I think, or maybe before that, where somebody did a study of personas. Mm -hmm. And they found their findings basically were that in this one, and they were very careful, they were good researchers. They said in this situation, personas did, were not cited very often. They studied the developer team and they found that personas were not really used much. And, and that wasn't surprising to me because you look at the context of it that, you know, it doesn't sound like there was a strong UX team that was working in this group. That's what I right. definitely right. Mm -hmm. But this has turned into, in the field, I hear a lot of people say, oh, personas don't work. There was that one article <sighs> that sort of showed, and I'm like, you know, we need to replicate that study, first of all. Right. A bunch of times that was, I mean, the researchers said, this is a limited study. This was a case study basically of this one group, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I mean, I find it just ridiculous to think that every fortune 500, I mean, all of these companies have personas and they're doing nothing like, yeah, they would have gone away. 
people don't like to waste time and money in the corporate world. Like they, they gotta be doing something. Well, and I think, you know, I, I think this is that, that key thing when you're citing articles that you need to use it in the proper context. And That's if right. it's a case study, right. then the results of the case study are just a cautionary heads up. It might not work all the time. And it could be that you have this situation and it does call for maybe more extensive research to be done. That's so don't, you know, aren't there like very varying things? Like it's like when we talk about sample size of a population, That's right. right? You have to have an appropriate size to say, and to blanket apply something. I am right. a firm believer in personas. People are, yeah. you're writing for people, people are people. And you, even as a writer, need to have an idea of who you're writing for. Because each time you're starting a new topic and you want to answer one thing and answer it well, who are you speaking to? Who's your audience? Who's your audience? Because And that, again, comes back to user-focused, right? Yeah. And it's so hard <clears throat> to write to a pie chart. That's what I tell people. Like, yes. What's the alternative to personas? Right. Yeah. You know, are you right. running to like search algorithms? Like what do you fit? And I don't, you know, I don't mean, I mean, if you're, if you can do that, that's great. If you can look at a bunch of search data and say, Hmm, this is the blog post that is going to match this. I can't do that. I need oh. a face. I need a living, breathing person that I can envision <clears throat> that has needs and yes. challenges and goals that I can say, here's what my content is supposed to do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I like the whole, I, I actually will build personas with a whole backstory. Yeah. Before, like when you were interviewing the people for the application that you're working right. on, you, you got to know them as people That's before right. they ever got to a boat. That's right. Right. Their That's whole, right. you know, their life. What do they do? That's you right. know, what's their family life? What's their social life like? What are their hobbies? You know, right. they're into boating, but what are their other hobbies? Like you're getting right. to know them. Right. And I think it, it adds a richness for you. And I think I think people are pretty smart and they know if they've built a persona that they know that that's not like a real person. It's like an average. Right. People, right. Which is again, the reason why you need to update them. Right. And the other criticism that comes up, I've literally seen this at design conferences where people say, Oh, personas, the customers are just made up. That was like an actual tweet from the IA summit one year, you know? <clears throat> and what I hear there is I'm like, well, that means you didn't talk to actual people. Right. You know, if your personas are made up, well, those are called assumption personas. And here I'm citing, you know, Whitney Cuisenberry. She's like, you can do that. You can come up yeah. with assumption personas That's when you're fine. starting. Yeah. But you eventually have to turn those into real personas by going and talking to real people. And if you don't, there's, they're always assumptions. You didn't, they're, 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 they're fictional. So, yeah. Right. But, you know, I mean, the pushback is, yeah. So what's your point? You got assumption ones and you have ones right. based on real interviews. They're... So. That's right. <laughs> so that's right. I think, and, you know, I think when I hear that, I just think it's ignorance. I think, I think there's a perception out there that no one is ever talking to users. Like these personas are coming from nothing. Right. And again, that's why I compare them to a pie chart. Cause no one's going to argue with a pie chart. No one's going to say, <clears throat> Oh, a pie chart. That's, that's made up. That's fictional. You know why? Because it's been around for forever. Right. We yeah. accept pie charts. I mean, personas are just a form of data, data visualization. Yes. That's really all they are. You know, yeah. and people forget right. that. Yeah. Right. So we had a good question in the chat, but I didn't want to interrupt because we were going on a good clip. Yeah. Um, so, and and we're right on time. So I will actually offer you the option to also take this and write up a blog post, and I'll send it to people afterwards because it's actually sure. a really good question. Um, it's sort of a you know, do we, instead of know your audience, we should list what we assume about the audience, who they are and what they know. And does that get you off the hook from context and use cases? And I think that it contributes to them in a way. So mm. it's a big question though, right? So, and we could go another half hour. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. And I would say really quickly that it does not um, <clears throat> take you off the hook. Um, right but it is very helpful. And that's where I really talk about assumption personas. I always start that way mm -hmm. with students and even first time developers, like when we're starting about an app, you know, cause they often have knowledge. Yeah. They say, Oh, I talked to so-and-so about this the other day. You know, th there's always anecdotal knowledge. So before you do the user study and it's good also to see what your biases are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
yeah. it's good to see what you think the personas are and then go go build some actual personas and then compare the two that's a great idea yeah that is a good idea yeah yeah what i often find when i do that <clears throat> is that one of your personas was pretty close. Like you, you had a, a user group in mind, but there were these three other user groups that you didn't even think about. Right. Yeah. And you wouldn't have discovered them had you not talked to actual people in a systematic way. Nice. Yeah, that's great. And that exposes bias and other things that yeah. we are not aware of. So that, yeah, this that's This is huge. a great topic for a blog post. I will write that. It is. it is. So, <laughs> write it, and then we'll have you back at room 40. Write it up, send it, it back. It'll be on the event page. <laughs> Keep the conversation uh, going. <laughs> I've got several things I've got to follow up with you on also. So there we go. Great. You never know what'll come out in conversation or what'll happen or what idea it will spark. And wow. I, we really appreciate you being here and giving us so many yeah. great ideas to, to build it from. It's been an absolute pleasure. It always is delightful to talk yes. to you, though. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's been a lot of fun. And I yeah. hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks, All right. everybody. And we see a great topic. Everybody loves it. Good job. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Thanks. Let's keep the conversations going. Yeah. We'll see you next time. We'll have you back. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye.